This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. An Old Mate of Your Father's by Henry Lawson. You remember when we hurried home from the old bush school, how we were sometimes startled by a bearded apparition, who smiled kindly down on us, and whom our mother introduced, as we raked off our hats, as an old mate of your father's on the diggings, Johnny, and he would pat our heads and say we were fine boys, or girls, as the case may have been, and that we had our father's nose, but our mother's eyes or the other way about, and say that the baby was the dead spit of its mother, and then added, for father's benefit, but yet he's like you, Tom. It did seem strange to the children to hear him address the old man by his Christian name, considering that the mother always referred to him as father. She called the old mate Mr. So-and-so, and father called him Bill, or something to that effect. Occasionally the old mate would come dressed in the latest city fashion, and at other times in a new suit of reach-me-downs, and yet again he would turn up in clean white moleskins, washed tweed coat, Crimean shirt, blucher boots, soft felt hat, with a fresh-looking speckled handkerchief round his neck. But his face was mostly round and brown and jolly. His hands were always horny, and his beard grey. Sometimes he might have seemed strange and uncouth to us at first, but the old man never appeared the least surprised at anything he said or did. They understood each other so well, and we would soon take to this relic of our father's past, who would have fruit or lollies for us. Strange that he always remembered them, and would surreptitiously slip shillings into our dirty little hands and tell us stories about the old days. When me and your father was on the diggings, and you wasn't thought of, my boy. Sometimes the old mate would stay over Sunday, and in the forenoon or after dinner he and father would take a walk amongst the deserted shafts of Sapling Gully, or along Quartz Ridge, and criticise old ground, and talk of past diggers' mistakes, and second bottoms, and feelers, and dips, and leads, also outcrops, and absently picked up pieces of quartz and slate, rubbed them on their sleeves, looked at them in an abstracted manner, and dropped them again. And they would talk of some old lead they had worked on. Hogan's party was here on one side of us, Macintosh was here on the other. Mac was getting good gold, and so was Hogan. And now, why the blankety-blank weren't we on gold? And the mate would always agree that there was gold in them ridges and gullies yet, if a man only had the money behind him to get at it. And then perhaps the governor would show him a spot where he intended to put down a shaft some day. The old man was always thinking of putting down a shaft, and these two old fifty-niners would mooch round and sit on their heels on the sunny mallow heaps and break clay lumps between their hands, and lay plans for the putting down of shafts and smoke, till an urchin was sent to look for his father and Mr. So-and-so, and tell them to come to their dinner. And again, mostly in the fresh of the morning, they would hang about the fences on the selection and review the livestock, five dusty skeleton cows, a hollow-sided calf or two, and one shocking piece of a queen's scenery, which, by the way, the old maid always praised. But the selector's heart was not in farming, nor on selections. It was far away with the last new rush in Western Australia or Queensland, or perhaps buried in the worked-out ground of Tambura, Married Man's Creek, or Araluan, and by and by the memory of some half-forgotten reef or lead or last chance, nil desperandum or brown snake claim would take their thoughts far back and away from the dusty patch of sods and struggling sprouts called the crop, or the few discouraged, 
half-dead slips which comprise the orchard. Then their conversation would be pointed with many golden points, Bakery Hill, Deep Creeks, Maitland Bars, Specimen Flats, and Chinaman's Gullies. And so they'd yarn till the youngster came to tell them that Mother says the breakfast is getting cold. And then the old mate would rouse himself and stretch and say, Well, we mustn't keep the missus waiting, Tom. And after tea, they would sit on a log of the wood heap, or the edge of the veranda, that is, in warm weather, and yarn about Ballarat and Bendigo, of the days when we spoke of being on a place oftener than at it, on Ballarat, on Galgon, on Lambing Flat, on Creswick, and they would use the definite article before the names as on the Tyrone, the Lachlan, the Home Rule, the Canadian Lead. Then again they'd yarn of old mates, such as Tom Brook, Jack Henright, and poor Martin Ratcliffe, who was killed in his golden hole, and of the men whom they didn't seem to have known much about, and who went by the names of Adelaide Adolphus, Corny George, and other names which might have been more or less applicable. And sometimes they'd get talking, low and mysterious-like, about the Eureka Stockade, and if we didn't understand and ask questions, what was the Eureka Stockade, or what did they do it for? Father would say, Now, run away, Sonny, and don't bother. Me and Mr. So-and-so want to talk. Father had the mark of a hole on his leg, which he said he got through a gun accident when a boy, and a scar on his side that we saw when he was in swimming with us. He said he got that in an accident in a quartz crushing machine. Mr. So-and-so had a big scar on the side of his forehead that was caused by a pick accidentally slipping out of a loop in the rope and falling down a shaft where he was working. But how was it they talked low and their eyes brightened up and they didn't look at each other but away over sunset? and had to get up and walk about and take a stroll in the cool of the evening when they talked about Eureka. And again they'd talk lower and more mysterious-like, and perhaps Mother would be passing the wood heap and catch a word, and ask, Who was she, Tom? And Tom, father, would say, Oh, you didn't know her, Mary. She belonged to a family Bill knew at home and Bill would look solemn till Mother had gone, and then they would smile a quiet smile and stretch and say, Ah, well, and start something else. They had yarns for the fireside too, some of those old mates of our father's, and one of them would often tell how a girl, a queen of the diggings, was married, and had her wedding ring made out of the gold of that field, and how the diggers weighed their gold with the new wedding ring for luck by hanging the ring on the hook of the scales and attaching their chamois leather gold bags to it, whereupon she boasted that four hundred ounces of the precious metal passed through her wedding ring, and how they lowered the young bride, blindfolded, down a golden hole in a big bucket, and got her to point out the drive from which the gold came that her ring was made out of. The point of this story seems to have been lost, or else we forget it, but it was characteristic. Had the girl been lowered down a duffer, and asked to point out the way to the gold, and had she done so successfully, there would have been some sense in it. And they would talk of King and Maggie Oliver, and G.V. Brook, and others, and remember how the diggers went five miles out to meet the coach that brought the girl actress, and took the horses out and brought her in, in triumph, and worshipped her, and sent her off in glory, and threw nuggets into her lap, and how she stood upon the box seat, and tore her sailor hat to pieces, and threw the fragments amongst the crowd, and how the diggers fought for the bits and thrust them inside their shirt bosoms, and how she broke down and cried, and could in her turn have worshipped those men, loved them, every one, they were boys all, and gentlemen all, 
There were college men, artists, poets, musicians, journalists, bohemians all, men from all the lands and one. They understood art, and poverty was dead. And perhaps the old mate would say slyly, but with a sad, quiet smile, Have you got that bit of straw yet, Tom? Those old mates had each three pasts behind them, the two they told each other when they became mates, and the one they had shared. And when the visitor had gone by the coach, we noticed that the old man would smoke a lot, and think as much, and take great interest in the fire, and be a trifle irritable, perhaps. Those old mates of our fathers are getting few and far between, and only happen along once in a way to keep the old man's memory afresh, as it were. We met one today, and had a yarn with him, and afterwards we got thinking, and somehow begun to wonder whether those ancient friends of ours were, or were not, better and kinder to their mates than we of the rising generation are, to our fathers, and the doubt is painfully on the wrong side. End of story.